Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. My name is Runlan, and I work for Sci-Fi Taiwan. Today, let me start this talk with this picture, the Odysseus and Polyphemus, which makes the title of the session. <sighs> As a matter of fact that we all know, Rizfa is very much like the Greek world. They many polis, meaning city-states running their own business. And there are many, many, many too many extensions. A lot of them are proposed and ratified by individual test groups. Also, there are many, many, never too many IP vendors. They make their own RISPR IPs, and a lot of them are equipped with their homegrown flavors. Either they are vendor extensions, uh, specialized app microarchitectures, or even box yikes. And here comes the million dollar question. What and how shall we tell the user space about all these differences? What do we have here? The CSR, and vendor ID, and architecture ID, and implementation ID. Are these CSRs enough? Could be. Yet it requires a giant table to decode this kind of set into a specific uh, vendor and model. So it shouldn't be the only information we pass through to the user space. And speaking of the ISA string, so will ISA string be enough? Well, uh, there's something ugly that, you know, the ISA, the, the risk five privilege spec regulates the ISA string itself changes from time to time. As you know that there is some uh, single letter extension, hypervisor extension edge. It was put into the ISA string once and got removed. So even though risk five Foundation making clear that they won't touch the freeze of ISA spec, but sometimes it changed. So uh, this could break as well. And even though we have all this, all this information included, Different batches of except model of IC with different, uh, you know, man manufacturing details could be different in the performance characteristic. So this is a mess. And all right, let's just pretend we solve it. Let it. Let us just blend all this information into DDB and pass to the user space. Uh, but by what exactly are we go doing? Going to plumbing through this kind of information to the user space programs? Someone may say that we can use the proxy view info. Well, there are a thing called Linux containers, and they don't like to uh, mount proc FS for security concerns because it will expose the details. And even they let you use the proc security info. Uh, things like uh, LX, LXC, the Linux container, wants to put the facade on it to masquerade the information. So this might be problematic as well. So someone may propose to use the hardware cap. Uh, hardware cap is uh, will return an unsigned long uh, type of information. So uh, there's only 32 bit on the RV32 platform. That, and you, if you want to squeeze all the information, that will be a very long unsigned long. So that's not going to work as, as well either. So things, uh, there are some roaming patches on the main list saying that maybe we can use the hardware cap too. Well, another bit vector, seriously, because, you know, with multi-layer ISA string that this won't fit into the another 32. It's just, it, uh, it's just uh, make the problem surf later. So we come up with this uh, little bit drastic idea that we put people uh, put the information to the VDSO data where kernel passed the information to the user space. Uh, so oh, even though it's only S390 using it now, but it's there, the framework is there so we can define the architecture dependent data into the VDSO data. And what's, what's even better is that uh, the Arc VDSO data is per core, meaning per hot. So, and there are existing risk by cores such as the Starfire.pay. Uh, it's heterogeneous. There are the cores, uh, the hearts with the vector and the hearts without vector. So this could actually facilitate them. And here comes a very simple example. Uh, sorry, the, the mechanism is uh, explaining. So when the kernel loads the ELF, it will put the hard information on the VDSO data and also push the hardware cap to with the value of the start address of the VDSO data. So the user program could either use, you know, the VDSO function call or a system called backing up the VDSO function call or even directly accessing the VDSO data with the hardware cap, the pointer that's stored in the hardware cap too. So here's the look and feel. Well, it's a little bit. Okay. 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 The... Uh, I'm not very sure. Yeah. Or is, how, or how do you zoom in like this? Whatever. Uh, now I've 
breaking it. There we go. Okay. I don't know how to. Okay. I, sorry. I, no, I have no idea. <laughs> that's, that's okay. That's okay. Well, so I'm just trying to show a very example, very simple example that uh, when a user program could use uh, get x get extra value of the hardware cap two, and then you can if you know the layout of the the videos or data, then you can access directly. So here's printing out the you know the the extension and just the major minor number and the and mark and the vendor ID. And if you're use you, if you're in most of cases that in the user program, we just want to know whether extension exists or whether a specific ver version of the extension exists. So it can, you can do a very sim it can uh, propose a very simple VDSO function that will check whether of extension exists and return the version of it. And also because it is a VDSO function, of course you can design your system call backing up the, the VSO function. So as a fallback, if you're using some kind of the, you know, MMU-less system, you can just use the system call. So the technical details that uh, we can divide, uh, just like, like I said before, you can define uh, Archive VDSO data with the, you know, the vendor ID, MRC ID, and the vendor ID. And uh, this is just a proof of concept data structure that actually Palmer and Paul Wamsi has proposed a much more complete, well-defined data structure. So I will bring it to the backups. And after that, uh, in the parse DDP logic, meaning the boot sequence of the risk by platform, there, this function will be, be ran. And uh, the, the VDSO data will be updated with the, the sorry, let me breathe a little bit. <laughs> it will update the VDSO data with the hard information. And so here comes the good, the bad, the ugly parts. The good, I think that the information could be free form, even if you don't like what Palmer and Paul Wimsey have proposed, you can design whatever you want and using this plumbing mechanism. The information is per hard, and just like I said, there are already Star, Starfire hub, hub here using the heterogeneous cost, CPU cluster, so we can deal with that. So if you really, really want to use it on the memory list, I guess you can just get a system call and access it directly. But the bad part is that, well, it's I'm, currently I'm doing it in the DDP parsing logic. So if you enable disable CPU features such as the VD, VPU, the vector processor unit in the wrong time, the information will be mismatched to the hardware. So yeah. And the ugly part is that uh, since you're trying, we, we, I'm trying to use the, you know, string compare to do the extension checking, but you know, VDSO function doesn't have any center library ever see support. So I need to copy case the string com compare into the VDSO function part. So this is the ugly part. And as artist has reminds me that Plumber is more for a discussion. So I will leave the, all the detail on my GitHub repo and you can uh, go to the link with the slides. And that's it. Maybe it's time for ask what question. Yeah, please. I really didn't understand what problem you have with CFS, not PROCFS, which is deprecated, but CFS, what's the problem with it? Also, you mentioned that you're, you, you want to introduce a new system call. Why not? But that problem, that, that, that's a lot of patching for something that IO control could do uh, as well. No need for a new system call. Uh, and if you have a new system call on your control, I really don't understand what the problem is with MMUS systems. That would still work. Uh, uh, so two two questions. Yeah, two questions. In. The sysfs part and yes. the system call part. The sys the sysfs is actually just like the you know that's just like the blockfs. Some content. There are environments that, that doesn't want to among these type of things because it was supposed to much too many information not just the, uh, you know, the CPU info. So LXFS, the Linux container file system is a fuse and it will master rate all this kind of stuff, not just the procfs, but the sysfs as well. And for the system call part, uh, well, I, I think you got it right. <laughs> I mean, this, this is just kind of over designed. So yeah, maybe, maybe we can come up with something more cleaner. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, please. We need to use the mic. Down there. Nice. <laughs> um, isn't the VDSO actually mapped into the process address space when the process is started? So that's the benefit of the VDSO that the um, process can immediately access the data. 
Uh, sorry, good. So uh, can we count? Yeah, just count again. Um, do I understand it right that the VDSO data are immediately mapped into the process address space when the process is started? So yes, the code can immediately read the um, HV cap to oh when it is running without doing any open syscalls on sysfs, this kind of stuff. Yeah, if you yeah yeah that, yeah that's the part of it yeah, because video so data is mapped to the process when is the when the life of the process begins. Uh, so yeah, you don't need to use the system call. You can, and and the uh, the hardware cap two is pushed to the cur uh, push to the users uh, to the accessory vector at the beginning of the life. So yeah, you can access it during the. C startup run C startup, C startup procedure to do some kind of like uh, indirect function. If you have indirect function, you can access it directly without any support. So yeah, that's uh, that's sorry, sorry, sorry for that. That's wrong. convenient. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. So I have a question regarding that, um, and that is uh, when we are looking at the at the specification, we also have um, architectural information which is not covered by the MArch string. For example, the uh, cache block size of the CBO instructions. Sorry, come again. You mean what is not covered? Sorry. Um, we have the CBO instructions which are operating on cache block uh, sizes or on cache blocks, oh, with, oh, I'm, I'm, which have sizes which are implementation specific. Yeah. And they are not covered by the image string. How is this handled? And if we are looking at this in, in general, there is also non-architectural uh, information, for example, fast unaligned accesses, which would also be uh, interesting to see um, by the user space. Yeah, uh, just as I mentioned, that this is just a prototype and, and you can just blend it into the DTV and you can write uh, if you, uh, the, the whole point here is that uh, because the, the information is stored in the VDSO data, so if you know what the, what's the layout, what's what's kind of the information being being pushed onto the <laughs> VDSO data, you can access it. So maybe you can design a special maybe a DTS node to to uh, I'm not sure you're doing the cache block size. Yeah. Yeah. So you can you can encode your, your cache block size into a DTS node, and you will be push to the VDSO data. And if you know that their information is there, you can read it out. This, uh, yeah, this is not in the POC, but I'm, I'm sure it's very, very easy to put it into the field. Yeah. Yeah, so I actually, I think it's on. Is this one? This one's on, okay, yeah. I actually uh, have been messing around with some code and I have a version of this that, you know, kind of matches this, it's more bitmap based than string based um which i think is something we need to sort out um but the proof of concept that i was using for performance was uh you know unaligned access speed right so the idea is that like you know getting the information that's in the iso string out to user space like that's kind of the easy stuff you know because that's all defined by the spec and whatnot but there's loads of information that we don't have in the iso string Right, so we sort of need our own format anyway. You know, wh whether or not we pass slice a string also doesn't matter so much, right? Because uh, we need to encode extra information. Right, so the idea is to basically just have various key value pairs to encode information that's not encoded in the ISO string, whether it's performance stuff or errata or you know vendor custom extensions that are sort of ISO string adjacent. Right? Um, they kind of all just go into the same bin. If that makes sense, right? Um, and then that's it. Right, so the online access support, I was just, I tossed something in the DT for it, which is kind of clunky. I'm not sure it's the right place to get the information from, because then you're just going and modifying all the DTs. You're kind of just, you know, relying on that to be correct. Um, but at least the user ABI, I think we can get something pretty stable for. But if you mix it together with the MH string, aren't you um, probably getting a collision later on with future extensions? Uh, so in my proposal, there's key value pairs for each of these. Okay. Right. And, you know. This one. Yeah. You so, can, you so, can so, put a right, key okay, there. Right, okay, it's up here. Yeah, so there, there are distinct keys for the non ISO string components. Um, and I'm actually providing some of the ISO string components via bitmaps as well um, under the assumption that 
those were easier to handle than strings in user space, particularly because like the ISO string has changed definition over time. So if you try to just say it's the ISO string, you can't really parse that without knowing also the version of the spec that that ISO string corresponds to. So it starts to get really complicated. And we have a lot of ISO string parsers like in all of our repositories, and they all have subtly different sets of bugs. And if you're like, if you know, this is UABI, so it has to be stable, right? So if, if your UABI is like, here's this string that changes every year, and we have to live with everybody in user space who parsed it, how they felt like parsing it at that time, it's going to get very hard to maintain compatibility in the future. Um, so that's why I'm leaning towards the bit uh, vector stuff, because then at least, you know, we set a bit, we know exactly what it means. And in the future, when things change, we can figure out how to make it work. So the key for each extension is different. Um, I actually have right now, I don't know, like, I don't really know what the right answer is here, but I just packed a bunch of extensions into a single key that were all defined at the same time. That seemed straightforward. Um, but uh, yeah, I, that, that kind of like fine grained detail of how to encode the stuff, I think is best ways to work it out in the mailing list. I'm not super worried about that. I, I think the, the big thing is like, are we going to say we're just providing ISO string to user space and then that becomes ABI, right? Or are we going to try to do something else that's not ISO string based? And once we're kind of making up our own stuff, we have a lot of, you know, our own interface that we're going to carry forward, uh, which is kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, irrespective of whatever we do, we still need the output in proxy for info, isn't it? Sorry, need the what? Uh, irrespective of uh, whatever we do, uh, we still need the proxy info, proxy view info output just for the user's uh, perspective to know what extensions are there without using any tools. Yeah, I mean, proxy view info, I think, solves a slightly different problem, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? Like, it's a useful thing. Um, yeah. One of the things I'm kind of hesitant in doing is providing information in only proxy view info, and then you're basically making people treat that as, like, full-on ABI, parsed by a bunch of programs, all that kind of stuff. You don't want to be changing proxy view info, info all the time, but I'm kind of hesitant to say, hey, that's the only place we're encoding a bunch of information, you know, live with it, because folks in the user space will just go find the information where they need it. Um, but yeah, I think like once we start to have an interface that's a little easier to reason about the ABI stability of, then we start whacking more stuff in proxy view info, because it's useful, like you just cat it to figure out what sort of machine you're on, that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a question uh, behind. Uh, since you mentioned the MMU list systems, I wonder what's the current state of the MMU list system and whether you use PMP for uh, uh, having a per VDSO per process or not? Or I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little confused. Uh, can, can you sleep, uh, the current say a little bit slower? <laughs> yeah, the current uh, state uh, of the MMU list risk five port. Uh, what does it currently protect and whether I use PMP regions for the VDSO? Yeah, the, uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question right. Uh, uh, you say that MAULS system doesn't have VDSO data, right? Or did I get that? How do you implement or map a VDSO uh, per process? Do you use PMP regions or what? Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, Damien's actually probably the right person to answer this. The question is, do you use PMP to keep protection with MMU systems? On the MMU list system, there's no video. The only board I played with with no MMU had the buggy PMP. If you touch it, the board just go boom. So I don't think it's used at all. It was just on the slides. Thank you. Oh, it's no MMU, come on, there's no protection anyway, so <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Application oh, bug right. and you, you crash everything. So one interesting thing um, on how x86 does this with uh, with CPU ID basically is that CPU ID is trapped. And it's an interesting feature because when you when you do virtualization, when you run VM, you can expose different set of uh, CPU features to your guest and pretend that your guest doesn't support a set of features even though your, your hardware does support it or the other way around. And it's a it's a very useful feature for cloud providers when they want to 
run a, a, a homogeneous set of, uh, of, of uh, virtual machines on top of an heterogeneous uh, cluster. So I'm wondering if uh, if we are taking uh, the vir this virtualization aspect into account uh, with that proposal, or yeah. with even with the IOS I I proposal. I don't think we I don't think we could we, we would be able to 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 handle that kind of feature. Which is I'm not saying we should do CPID and specific instruction or anything, but it, the fact that CPID is trapped by default on x86 provides this this interesting feature. Yeah. I mean, this is basically a CPID syscall or VDSO entry point or whatever. Mm -hmm. It looks almost exactly the same. Actually, during our kind of discussion with uh, Palmer, we, all, we at some point we think that we can maybe we can provide a pseudo CSR or things like that for or even a SBI call for the you know for, for the upper layer of the system yeah. to query this kind of things. But uh, because the, you, you can just because it's provided by uh, currently it's provided by DDB, so maybe you, if you're a hypervisor, you can provide a fake DDB. Or... If if you're an hypervisor, you you in in many many cases you actually don't have the luxury of you know the guest is going to use a, a full blown image coming with a DTB or with an ACPI description or with with a full blown firmware. So the the advantage of the trapped Trap and emulate approach is that you can you can dynamically configure your, your VM through your hypervisor to say I want to, I want my VM to see this specific set of features and nothing else, regardless of which image it's running and which DTB or ACPI tables or whatever. Yeah, that makes sense. So we don't have anything in the ISA to probe stuff. Probing is all external, so we need to add a bunch of stuff for that. Yeah, it's a sensible use case. Yeah. That's, I'm yeah. Just calling out for it. Yeah. I think it's a sensible use case. I think it's just going to be a big uphill battle to get that in that ISA. <laughs> maybe not maybe not in ISA, but the 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 you know as part of the specification make make it I mean I don't know something that we could trap uh, from the advisor and it, it, like yeah so right now we have a yeah. yeah which are firmware calls yeah. but if you're worried about the too much of the firmware coming along with the guest image, then you're kind of hosed, yeah. you know. So, um, I think I think if, if you're really worried about guest images that come with their own firmware and are kind of ignoring what's below them in, in hypervisor land, then the only way to deal with that is some sort of instruction that you trap. Or, hey, Palmer, Palmer. Or, yeah, or Palmer, can I add some info? Yeah, fair. You could hey, Palmer. Um, so, in context of KVM, actually, uh, Palmer, can you hear me? Yeah. So in case of KVM, uh, it's or in general for high prices, it's not just about detecting or showing a particular set of uh, features to the VM. It's also about uh, providing the ability to the users to disable also certain extensions using HEMV config or SM statin. So it is it's like a um, configurability of the features as well when it comes to hypervisor, right? So at the moment, or at least how it's done in different artists and how we are doing in RISPI as well for KVM is that we have this. A standard IOCTL interface that we one bridge interface through which we are showing the uh, features that we can virtualize and some of them can be also disabled as well. So using which if there is a heterogeneous cloud, uh, so administrator can come up with a common denominator of the features uh, uh, for the VM and then uh, the migration will work across the uh, heterogeneous machines. So it, it, it's, so it's, it's not, not just about it. detecting it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So it's not just about detecting the feature, it's also about the ability to disable some of them, right? So in case of hypervisors. Right? So. Uh, I'm not really... uh, okay, there... so I don't know if there are any more questions. For the VDSO format, uh, the, I what I understood is that are like two of them are in floating. The slide was showing one and there was a Google Doc link or are the same? The slide, oh, uh, I, I changed the slide a little bit. So this is the newest version. So it will have some backup slides like the Palmer's proposal. So it's a little bit different than the previous one. So is, is, is you asking why the slides is different? No, 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 no. I was asking the VDS format that you implemented, the, the one you slow, showed in the slides. 
and there was a Google Doc link. Are they same or different? Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So it teach there's like a bunch of different proposed encoding formats in the various slides. Oh. And there's a couple of different copies of the slide set. Ah, I see. Okay, we, we want to discuss the format or are we going with the key value? I mean, we can talk about it if you want. I yep, am really is. bad about like bit encoding in person. <laughs> like to me, that's very much a mailing list thing, but yeah, sure. You, like what do you want to talk about? <laughs> we have a few I, minutes. I, I'm not seeing the format. So there's like, we have still 10 minutes. So if we don't have any other questions in the room. Yeah, Jessica. That. There we go. Yeah, um, I had a couple of um, points. The first one was you said that having it be per heart was a feature, and in some sense that is because that gives you more information. But for most code that just has iFunk resolvers in plain C, it's not trying to pin to CPUs, it's not trying to care about what heart it's running on. So having information that's potentially incorrect for CPUs it may later be scheduled on is actually quite unhelpful. And you'd really like just a summary of what can I assume from my generic C code? Um, is there provision for having something that is just, this is what you can assume without doing anything special? Yeah, so I have a syscall, which may not be the way, right way to get the, uh, the user, the information to user space, sorry. Um, but the reason I did the syscall is so it can take a uh, CPU set T or CPU mat, whatever, the, the same thing all the scheduler calls take. Right, so you provide that, and then it tells you what's on all of the CPUs that are in the set that you gave it. So if you have pinned yourself, you can very straightforwardly ask. And if you have not pinned yourself, then you know you just ask for everything. Sure. Um, and then the second one was obviously this is a Linux farmers conference, and this is very the Linux focused to the result, but you know, other operating systems do exist and they're going to have to solve the same problems and it sure would be nice if everyone had the same interface so we don't have to have if defs everywhere in all our software um and the ar64 world everyone sort of settled on the hardware caps in the x86 world you can just use cpu id um, it would be nice if you know despite whatever underlying mechanism exists for whether it's a vdso or a syscall that there were some slightly higher level not very high level but you know the c function that you can just call for example um that will provide an interface that other operating systems could implement yeah both like both the arm and x86 ones are pretty like grounded by the isa yeah the arm stuff basically yeah. is passing through whatever control registered map that they have for this stuff and x86 obviously a cpu id so it'd be really good to have something so everyone's not just making up their own thing that seems yeah. reasonable yeah i mean you know and previously you know we can back it with a syscall rather than that magic VDSO, or we can put it in our share page, doesn't really matter, but just having the the API is a well-defined thing that's slightly separate from the OS. Would be yeah, I, I think like the mechanism by which you get to the information from user space is not super exciting, right? It's like, yes. what is that and actual bit encoding of those tables? Yes, and I think there's a slight conflation of the two in this talk at the moment um, that I just would like to make sure that we try and tease apart as the discussion goes forward. Oh, we, no, but that's just Jessica still. The, the Google Doc uh, link shared in the slide doesn't have access. So if you can uh, give. Okay, maybe that's the All right then, so I guess there's no other questions. So maybe we can end this early or sure, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Your talk. You spent <laughs> so much time talking. <laughs> yeah.